That's all wrong. Relativity! They also wanted the animated characters to really feel like they're placed in the environment. It's interesting seeing cartoon animation that's not Disney based, it's not Warner Brothers based. And by the way, that's a different style than the Pixar storyboarding style. Thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. Stick around to the end to see how you can get a free 30 day trial. Hey you, hey what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Animators React. We got Eric Koenig on the couch today with us. Eric has brought a bunch of really cool old school animation. And we're gonna be looking at the directing behind cartoons. I'm really curious to see your insights into how directors through the ages have done animation. So let's jump into it. So we're looking at Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, not the Peter Jackson films, <laughs> the OG Lord of the Rings and the Whoa, Hobbit. Oh wait, hold on though, like Strider in the corner with like the the, the hood, hood over his head, yeah. like it has the same feel from the live action movies. It does, and it's a real tribute to Ralph Bakshi, the director. He invented a lot of this style, and Peter Jackson then kindly say paying homage to this movie quite a bit. My name is Mr. Underhill. After your performance tonight, it won't matter what you call yourself. This movie uses a technique that's called rotoscoping. We've talked about rotoscoping oh, yeah. many times in yeah. the show. Our audience is probably very familiar with what rotoscoping is because we are very familiar with what rotoscoping is. Cutting out people! It's very, very tedious. But wait, 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 wait. There's no real people in this. What's being rotoscoped? Oh well, yeah, yeah, good point. I'm not so, seeing any, any footage. What's being rotoscoped? Well, so what they would do is they would go out and film people and then they would print out all the frames of the footage and then the animators would trace over the character. Problem is, you can't just trace things over because, you know, humans, we move around a lot and we're not even quite aware that we're moving around a lot. So you can see they're moving not like a normal cartoon character. Yeah. There's a little bit of that extra kind of like weight shift. They're like hyper real with their motion. Yeah. What happened on this movie is he was contracted to make one movie out of all three books, but he ran out of time and ran out of money. And so he gets through the two towers and then the movie just stops. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. I also distinctly remember in this movie, there were moments where it actually looked like there were real photographed people yeah. in it. That's real footage. That, that, that straight up just looks like real footage. You know, that's just real people. That is, that yeah. is real people in weird <laughs> costumes on horses. And then they painted it and they did some compositing. It's a very distinct style though. Part of me wonders like, it's kind of weird and janky because they're running out of time, but what if they just leaned into it and accepted and embraced this style? Would they have been able to actually finish the whole movie? Cinematically, it is telling pretty much the same story as the Peter Jackson version. And Ralph Bakshi did it. You know, there's props to him. He made Lord of the Rings. So along comes Rankin and Bass, who's most famous for Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman. They get contracted to make The Hobbit. Bilbo Baggins. Uh, yes. I am looking to hire a burglar. What Peter Jackson took, if you watch the extended editions, eight hours. They smished it down to a half an hour, and it's a thousand times better. <laughs> I'm sorry. The original Hobbit, animated Hobbit, is just a better movie. There's Smog, you know, and he's much more of a character than the Benedict Cumberbatch, Benedict Cumberbatch version, you know, and his voice is a, is a better cast voice. There's very little animation, but he's scary. It's interesting seeing cartoon animation that's not Disney based, it's not Warner Brothers based. You know, I'm not used to seeing dragons drawn like that. I'm not used to seeing cartoon hobbits drawn like this. Yeah, yeah dude, that dragon looks like a friggin' bear pelt. That's the beauty of animation. It's anything you imagine. And at its purest, it's being used to tell a story that you can't tell in any other medium. I do feel like that's something that you lose a little bit when you, like if you heavily rotoscope people for your animation and it's just, okay, I got the footage and I just traced over it. It's like, cool, you're, kind of just a human Photoshop filter versus like bringing imagination to it and portraying images that don't exist in real life and taking it a step further. Well, yeah, and there's that, I think Robert Zemeckis was trying to make a few films with that kind of motion capture. The Polar Express. The Polar Express, which I believe you guys have talked about. And the Polar yeah. Express could have been a much better movie if they just traditionally animated it. Yeah, if you're trying to make it look like live action, just film it in live action. Yeah. It's not to say you can't rotoscope things to make them cool. I mean, a scanner darkly is not trying to look real. You know? No, it's it's, yeah. it's its own distinct style. And again, 
again, there is really good examples of motion capture. Thanos is brilliant, you know, and is totally taking advantage of the actor and combining it with the animation, mm -hmm. and it's, it's incredible. Going back to Warner Brothers, a brilliant animator named Richard Williams got the opportunity to make a fairly famous movie called Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <gasps> oh, <laughs> no way, okay. You know, the idea of combining live action and animation together had been done, you know, before, you know, all the way back to the very beginning of animation, but also in, most famously in things like Mary Poppins and whatnot. But Robert Zemeckis wanted to move the camera. He wanted to make a movie that played as a movie first and then combine the animation. So it was a real technical wizardry of both the brilliant animation of Richard Williams and the technical wizardry of ILM. <laughs> They also wanted the animated characters to really feel like they're placed in the environment, which is a little bit different than like if you look at Mary Poppins where the characters are flat, you know, opaqueness, shading. In this case, there's smoke in the bar. So they added a layer of smoke over the characters in the compositing layer so that they really feel like in the environment. Like they're actually matching the black levels. The penguins in the background, their black levels match the black levels of the people's clothes around them. Yeah. So it's like they're actually there and being filmed through the camera lens. They really wanted to combine both the practice practical elements with the animated characters. So the penguins are holding real trays, or in the case of this, those are real pianos. So they had to really carefully plan this whole sequence out so that when they got to the animation, they knew exactly what they were doing. So we actually took a look at this scene on an episode of Visual Effects Artist React. So we've already broken down the technical aspects of how you would actually merge these things together. But it's really interesting to see what you're talking about with the shading and the intent behind how you would actually animate these characters here. The other thing that Richard Williams is famous for and capitalized on, even before doing Roger Rabbit, is he loved the real fluidity of animation on ones. So the idea of, you know, there's 24 frames a second, <laughs> it's expensive. Yeah, I was about to say, you're, you're just instantly doubling your workload. <laughs> yeah, and in the case of this, it is needed because of the mixing of the live action, because live action moves on ones. But in traditional animation, it, it's generally not needed unless the character is doing some kind of real fast motion. But it was really his style. The famous project that he was working on on the side is called The Thief and the Cobbler. It's this film that he worked on for over 27 years. We talk about a, an artist that gets so buried in the details. Well, if you watch this movie every detail is perfect once upon a time there was a golden city in the center of the golden city atop this is wow, shot. that's hand drawn. This is hand drawn. That looks like a 3D model. Yeah, he's yeah. just orbiting a 3D model. He's just like he's yeah. got his viewport and he's just like orbiting around. But you know, just that's so much work. This is insane. Yeah, a shot like that. So a normal piece of animation paper is about this big. It's called 16 field. It's about this big. That scene was drawn on pieces of paper bigger than this couch. Wow. Can you imagine trying to like you know how you like yeah, hold the papers? And... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't know. They must have taken like three people just to flip the animation. What ended up happening is, is that Warner Brothers agreed to fund the completion of this movie. He signed a completion bond, which basically says you have two years to finish the movie. Otherwise we take it away from you. Hmm. And he couldn't let it go. He couldn't finish. And so Warner Brothers took it away to finish it. And it came out under a different title. I think it's Arabian Nights or something like that. And they hacked out oh, the dang. last bit of the animation and they ruined his, his genius. What I would say is, it's really cool, but why? Yeah. Is the probably six months it took to do that shot worth not getting to tell your story? No, not at all. It is good to have constraints. Yeah. You know, they work. You then have to use your imagination in the constraints and find a more effective way of dollying up to those three bold balls. You know, talking about getting carried away, it calls to mind red line. Someone's having doubts, huh? Hell, I'm just trying to keep this thing interesting. This looks like Can't something wait. that would be in Love, Death, and Robots, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all drawn. Relativity! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we talk about this with Akira. You know, Japanese animators are, I think it, it comes from their penmanship when they're young and they have this discipline. They're just brilliant artists. Jesus! 
I was just going to talk about the cleanup with the real thick lines and the black tone to animate a character and have them move around, but to keep all of that consistent is a huge amount of work. Yeah, so you're not just doing lines and coloring, you're also now doing shading as an additional step right. for every single frame. Yeah, and it has to be exact because if the, the little shape under his nose or you know between his cheeks is not exact, it'll start warbling. I mean, yeah, I've yeah. been there with trying to fix warbling issues, whether from rotoscoping or trying to track something in or trying mm -hmm. to paint something in, and you hit play and it's like, blah, 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 and you're like, no! <laughs> yeah. It took them seven years to make the film, and I believe it bankrupted the studio in the process. It goes into that realm of like labor of love and life's passion. Is that worth more than money and time? But at the same time, it takes money and time to make these things. And it's not just one person doing it either. You know, there's teams and there's companies right. at stake as well. And where do those constraints lie? Because at the end of the day, you know, Redline is a visual feast, but to what end does it serve? There's a lot more to be said on Redline. We'll do another episode where we go into it. We just, it was great to touch upon it here, but don't worry for all your Redline <laughs> fans out there. We'll definitely do more. To all the Kevins out there who subscribed after we asked you to, thank you, Kevin. Matt, it's your turn. <laughs> Brad Bird is pretty close to a current day household name of a director in animation. He's a real student of film, real passionate about it. His first job, actually, he developed the idea of this short. It's called Family Dog. Do you like what you see? You have to understand at the time, like none of these ideas of lights, you know, and really imaginative animation, very cinematic. It's, you know, he's combining his love of Disney and his love of things like Warner Brothers, and he's, he's marrying them together. The original designs for this were done by a young Tim Burton. He was a guy, you know, he steeped in like Edward Gorey and kind of thought out of the box and, you know, didn't think like a traditional animation designer. And he brought a lot of new life into this. <laughs> Because he was just such a student of live action, he had a great desire to also get into live action. And I think there was always this idea that getting into live action is more legitimate than doing animation. But to me, uh, animation is the ultimate art form. It's the art form that encompasses all art form. There's a perception that it's for little children, but it's not for little children. You just showed a clip from Redline. That's not for little children, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And when you have a brilliant director like Brad Bird, I greedily don't want him to do anything but make animated movies. And so fortunately, the next thing he did was a movie called Iron Giant at Warner Brothers. It's still alive! J shoot at it! Fire! This is early CG days, you know, around the same time as Toy Story. So he championed the giant is a CG element. And then you've got brilliant character animation. You know, this is an incredibly cinematic movie. It's very little that's differentiating it than how it would have been shot if it were a live action movie. Brad's thing was he likes to really lock down the storyboards. When you watch the story reel for Iron Giant, it looks like the movie just in black and white. They were able to get this incredibly beautiful movie for way less amount of money because everything is just really thought out. Yeah, the process is always easier when the vision is very clear right. going into it. Arguably, emotionally, you should be able to walk away from that, feeling exactly how you would if you watched the actual movie. They're just gonna add more polish to it by actually rendering right. it out with their 3D animation. And by the way, that's a different style than the Pixar storyboarding style. If you look at the story reel for Toy Story, it was less about figuring out every single character beat, every camera angle, and every bit of staging and lighting. They are just working on the character. It's a different style of filmmaking. This is John Lasseter's style of filmmaking as opposed to Brad Bird. He likes to push the technicalities of animation and the filmmaking of animation. And he's taken the art of animation into the future. Strange seeing the old Incredibles. Like, I actually haven't seen the original Incredibles. I've seen Incredibles 2. Oh. You've never seen the original one? I've never seen the original one. The original's here. great. I thought Clint didn't work here anymore. <laughs> yeah. So you can see the elements of the original Toy Story in it, like the animation, the lighting, the shading. It's all just like a little bit, just a little bit simpler. You know, Toy Story movies are uh, on a technical level are kind of interesting to watch because we watch Toy Story 1. It really looks dated now. Toy Story 1 looks like the animatic for Toy Story 4. It does. It does. <laughs> I, know, I know. I have some friends that worked on it. Toy Story 3 and Toy Story 4, and I remember they were battling that idea of like how much do they update the technique 
But yeah. they have to. In the end, all that really matters is, is it funny? Does it have heart? Does it tell the story? Does it connect with the audience? And again, looking at the technical flaws of some of the you know, earlier Pixar movies, it doesn't matter because this movie is amazing. I mean, the three of us are going to notice it, but you know, my <laughs> wife, she's going to punch me in the arm if I mention any of that. You know? so. I feel like a lot of our viewers have that issue now where like, they'll be watching a movie with their friends and be like, well, you know, the effects of this scene, one of the things they forgot <laughs> about, they're like, shut up! Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <sighs> That's right, guys. It's my favorite type of sponsorship, Audible. I get to talk about a book that I listened to recently that honestly was one of my favorites, Project Hail Mary. Have you seen The Martian? Well, the author of that story created this one as well, and I think this one is even better. So the story basically starts out, this dude wakes up on a spaceship in another solar system without any idea who he is or why he's there. But the story kind of unfolds with two parallel stories, one with him on the spaceship and two as he's remembering the context behind why he got there. I want to talk about some stuff in this book so badly but even just mentioning it would be a spoiler. All I'm gonna say is that the ending to this story was one of the best endings I've ever experienced. It was like it was so magical like it was upsettingly good and you can listen to it for free by simply going to the link in the description or texting Quarter Crew to 500-500. And their Plus catalog has gotten huge. You can get thousands of originals all just included with your monthly membership. Plus, as an Audible member, you get one free credit per month to spend on any audiobook you want. So you can get like really nice, expensive audiobooks and just spend your monthly credit on it. So it's like getting a, an expensive book for 15 bucks. So again, just text quarter crew to 500 500 or even easier, click that link in the description. You won't regret it. It's going to be great. But for now, let's say goodbye to Eric. Matt, I see you over there, Matt. You know, I actually have a lot of friends named Matt. All of you, you watching, you're my friends. Thank you for leaving a comment down below suggesting what we take a look at with the next Animators React. We need some more cartoons to check out. I need your help. Thank you. Eric, you bring so much knowledge here. In fact, one thing that I've tried to, that I've been inspired to do from you coming on the show is you are always particular with naming people who are involved in the work that you're talking about. And I'm striving to try to do more of that, to learn the names and say them aloud. Yeah, we, we can be a lot better about that. We tend to just like, oh, someone did that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for not only sharing a bunch of your knowledge with us, but also thank you for inspiring me be a better React host. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both. I, I love this uh, channel. I love you guys. Thank you and, so much. Uh, thank you. You know, as much as we geek out about this stuff, it's our job and we get to do this for a living. So I just can't thank you enough for getting to come here and talk about it. You bet, man. It's it's an honor and it's a privilege. We're all very fortunate and I love, I love how many people are clearly passionate about these movies and shows that we are all working on together in this industry. It's great to have somebody come in and be like, dude, I love this scene. This scene blew my mind when I was a kid. And it's like, yes, we all have that kid inside of us that, that loved this stuff growing up. Absolutely. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.